My name is Lindsay Baugh, and I am the, a professor and in the interior design program director in the College of Architecture. Today I get to introduce you to the Hyde lecturer whom the interior design program selected and invited to address the question, what's next, as it relates to the discipline, profession, practice, and even education of interior design. As an instructor, I am always looking for ways to elevate the content and approach to educating interior design students. Continually asking what's next is essential. How do we communicate our value? What role should we have with our allied disciplines? What systems and methods do we need to engage in? How do we continue to prove our relevance and our impact? The interior design program believes that Krista is one of these, those leading and innovating interior design professionals that can provide us with, all, with great insight into these very questions. Krista is a, leading, is a leader, pioneering the presence of interior design in the design community and has a record of design excellence. In 2014, Krista established her own design firm based in New York City, K & Company. This firm focuses on hospitality design and multifamily residential interiors. Krista splits her time as a part-time faculty member at Columbia and has taught previously for about four years at Parsons New School of Design. In 2014, Krista was named Contract Magazine's Designer of the Year, and the following year was named New, York, New York's Curbed Young Gun, which is an honor that recognizes the nation's young professionals who are challenging the status quo of the design industry. Krista was also responsible for establishing and defining a robust interior design division for the award-winning architecture firm Shop Architects, where she was hired in 2011 to be the director of the interior design program. Prior to Shop, she gained professional experience and expertise working for hospitality guru Rockwell Group and Avroco. Her academic background includes a Bachelor's of Fine Arts and a Bachelor's of Architecture from Rhode Island School of Design. That being said, it's a pleasure to introduce to you Krista Ninavaji. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Hey guys, um, thank you for inviting me. I've never been to Nebraska before, so it's always a treat actually to do lectures like this and get to see other parts of the country and see all the, the great work that everybody's doing in design schools all over. Um, so the title of the lecture, 2020 Future Focused, in a sense it's a lot about where I've been and where, where I'm going, so kind of the whole what's next. And you know, as we're approaching the year 2020, where, where am I going to take myself and where have I been? Um, but before we get into that, I want to just tell you about a project that I'm really excited about. Um, we did this over the summer. This is, um, I, we called it pop-up pool party. It was done um, on Roosevelt Island in Manhattan. It was a pool that looked a lot like, I don't know, the 70s. Um, it was kind of, it had this beautiful view of Manhattan, but it was pretty dreary looking. So the client actually wants to tear down the whole pool complex and uh, it's part of a residential complex of four buildings. There's about 200 units per building, so it's about 800 units sharing this one beautiful little gem, um, beautifully situa situated on the East River with views of Manhattan, but it just, it doesn't live up to what it could be. So we didn't, we were not hired in time to actually tear down and redesign the pool house for this current, or the last pool season. So we said, okay, well let's do 10 things that are not going to cost very much money and transform this space for at least this summer. And we're gonna make it feel like there's a pool party happening here every day. So this is where, what it looked like when we started. Um, we hired a, a, a street artist, a graffiti artist, Hot T. He actually is known for yarn bombing um, but he also does painted graffiti work. And so we worked with him, my, my firm, and uh, a colleague that I work with, Barack, who is a Pliskin Architects. Uh, the three of us worked together to create this. We rolled up our sleeves. We actually painted with hot tea. Here's his concept image that he started with. We worked together to kind of come up with what we thought the pattern should be. And you know, right before Memorial Day, we got to work. We started painting and taping out the letters around the pool. Um, 
and just transforming the space. There's some, some of my team members, uh, Johnson and Andrew. Andrew is actually just finishing a Master's of Architecture at the University of Cincinnati. There's all the colors. Um, Eric, also known as Hot Tea, uh, hand-selected all of those colors. Here's the team putting some shapes in the pool. And that's kind of the finished product before we installed all the furniture. And there's uh, all the furniture that we have and some great photos of it when it was done. And then um, one thing that we got to do was we put together this time lapse uh, that I'll show you guys. And this was kind of the first time that I was using video as part of the process. And so it was about 10 days that we did this. And we were able to get um, the band uh, Shinobi Ninja is a good friend and uh, will be my sister's husband. Uh, the drummer will be anyway. And they uh, were kind enough to score the soundtrack for us. So you can kind of see in real time all of us getting together to put this thing together.
So um, in any case, that was a fun project. It was actually my second built project under my own umbrella. So, um, you know, we start out modestly here. Um, but it was really, it was a lot of fun. And just to speak to the power of design, so all of the work that we did, and there was a lot more stuff that you didn't see in that video, it cost us about $90,000. They more than double made that back over the summer. So they increased the revenues from that space by a, almost $200,000 just because of the design um, and all of the social media hits that they were getting from it. And people have taken interest in the property as well. Okay. So going back, so I have an, a degree in architecture, um, but I will say that my whole career has been about aligning my interest in architecture and interior design, trying to balance these two things. Um, you know, I like to think of myself as an architect that just really has a, a fascination with interior spaces. And the thing that I loved about my architecture education was kind of these five principles that you know, that, I, that you are taught in architecture school, logic, the iterative process, efficiency, abstraction, and then leaking concepts with pragmatism. But I would say that what makes great architecture does not necessarily make great interiors, is what I've learned. And I think that you need to break those rules a little bit to do great interior spaces. And that logic is really taken over by the sense of emotion. Effic efficiency kind of goes out the window. It's, it's okay to have more. And then it's really about concept and experience um, and, and being less about function. Um, what do I mean by that? Uh, so logic and efficiency. Let's say you had a corridor that you needed to plan out. Typically, if you know an architect might lay out a, a long corridor, which we have plenty of them, they might lay out the flooring and the materials and finishes in this fashion, maybe even the stairway. It's very organized, very efficient. But I would say that actually if you were trying to make interesting interior space, you would actually want to go against that logic and then it would want to be more about the emotion. And yes, you're going to use more material and it's not as efficient, but you're going to create better space at the end of the day. So here's just a quick little SketchUp vignette. The tunnel vision that's created by running the material along with the path of travel. And then I like to call this going against the grain by breaking up that rhythm and not lengthening the space so much. Um, so logic and efficiency again, let's say you have a restaurant or a hotel or a reception area that you're walking into in a building. Logic would say that you want to put, um, actually I'm going to control L full screen. Um, logic and efficiency would say that you would want to put the desk where everyone would see it when you walk in so that you know you would be welcomed. Actually, I would say that you would want to create a welcoming experience that you feel like you can be at home, that it's kind of, the, the cues to how you use the space are automatically suggested and that if you need help or you need that welcoming that it's kind of off to the side and it's not intrusive. So here you have kind of the barrier of the reception desk whereas here you have the welcoming of a, a, hosp, hosp, a hospitality gesture with the help off to the side. So these are kind of just simple principles that I've noticed the difference between the way you might design as an architect versus um, an interior designer. A little bit about my background, a little scatter map of where I've been. Um, but basically, I grew up in New Jersey, and I grew up on pretty much on the Hudson River, staring at Gotham over the Palisades, just wanting to always be in New York. Um, by the fall of 97, I started at RISD. Um, but when I turned 21, I was spending a lot of time in the city. I was kind of coming down and interning a lot there. And the, the nightlife culture had shifted a little bit in New York. It had turned into more speakeasies, um, kind of cocktail lounges, and less of the kind of either dirty, dirty bars or big uh, dance hall nightclubs. Um, I interned uh, with, with uh, Sorry, at the Guggenheim, where I got to meet Charles Guathme. This is, I'm showing you the importance of, uh, of interning because pretty much every internship I've had has actually led to where I am today. So when I interned at the Guggenheim, I met Charles Guathme. They hired me the following summer to work there, which is where I had my first uh, architectural internship. Um, then from that, I was able to intern with Scott Kester. Scott Kester was a hospitality designer who was doing really hot up and coming restaurants and he also worked with David Rockwell Pryor, which was how I got my, um, my introduction to David when I would eventually meet, 
meet him and work with him in the fall of 2002. So, and while I was at Rockwell, I met Shop Architects, which would play a role in my career a little bit down the path. So what did I learn when I was at Rockwell? So I really learned about interiors while I was at Rockwell. The, the theater of hospitality was something that David is so good at infusing into all of his projects. Really creating immersive environments, pushing material boundaries, and then, as I said before, really just the practice of interior design. I had the skills as, as an architect, but this is where I really learned to care and think about the psychology of being in the interior space. By July of 2006, I went to the small boutique firm Avroco. Um, the firm was tiny when I started. I think they have three offices now all over the world. Um, I also started teaching at Parsons in 2008, which was a great experience. Um, you know, I really felt like I had to sharpen my skills and I had to kind of distill all of the things I had learned to date to be able to convey to my students. What did I learn at Avroco? Um, how to develop a concept narrative. This is very, very important. I love this, this particular example. So this is a restaurant we did called Park Ave Cafe. This restaurant actually changes um, it's since moved locations, so this current design, the design I'm showing you is not the current design. So if you go visit it in New York, it'll look a little bit different. Um, but how to develop a concept narrative. So the restaurant was a seasonal restaurant, and it had a seasonal menu. So the owner wanted to actually have the decor refresh. It had been there since 1992. But he wanted the decor to change with the season. So we had to come up with a whole system to make the, the room feel different. So aside from changing the wall panels, changing the lighting, we had the, the backs of the chairs in restaurants. The backs of the chairs add a ton of color into the space, so that was something really important. We added snaps to all of those cushions on the back so they could be swapped out easily. And we also changed the, the seating layout without losing one seat because one seat turns into revenue for the owner. So to actually physically change the space so you're sitting in one configuration in summer and a different configuration in fall, it's automatically going to emotionally feel different. Storytelling through design elements. What are the design, what are the materials, what are the objects that you're putting into the space that's going to, to uh, stand behind that concept narrative? Elegance from honest materials. Sometimes we, we do too much with materials. Sometimes a beautiful wall of marble is just a beautiful wall of marble. And how to lead the culture you promote. So Avroco not only owns and operates restaurants, but they also design them. And that was brought into the design studio as much as possible. We were constantly running behind the bar in our restaurants or having the sommeliers from the restaurants come and teach us about wine. We needed to know those things if we were going to design for that world. And then the logistics of running an interior design firm. Honestly, when you're in a small firm, you wear a lot of hats. And so I took on as much responsibility as I felt capable of. And the partners were so you know, busy with everything, they were more than happy to give me responsibility. So I really started to see, how do you write proposals? How do you hiring? I started to become in charge of hiring all the interns that would play later on into um, my role at shop. So you know, it's really where I kind of learned those skills. I would recommend to everyone here to when you're looking for jobs, really think, do I want to work for a, a large firm or a small firm? And then maybe work for both, see what you like better. Your answer might surprise you. So by January 2011, I had become friends with the partners at SHOP. Uh, we had actually started a softball team together, um, as, as legend has it, when I was at Rockwell. And I started another one at, um, at Avroco. And so through softball, they, you know, we kept having these talks in the bars after drinks. They wanted to start interiors, and they felt like I was the right one to do it, so I joined them in 2011. Um, at this time, I also won uh, the Young Gun by Curbed and Designer of the Year from Contract Magazine. So what did I learn at SHOP? Challenge the design problem as a whole. SHOP is very good at not just looking at what's what the design problem is, but looking at everything that surrounds it, whether it's the urban context or or even just the pure business of, of what, what the task is at hand. How, how is this project going to make money at the end of the day? Where is the money coming from? Believe in the process, be fearless, and discover a better solution. Often, 
not only I, but Shop was a young firm, were challenged with these giant projects that we had never done before. And in a way, we always said that that was our greatest asset, that you wanted to hire us because we didn't have experience doing an arena or a law firm because we needed to actually go in naively and understand what all the problems are and we were going to be looking at it with fresh eyes and we didn't have a formula to solve the problems that were at hand. There's no hierarchy when it comes to good ideas. We constantly would sit around as a group and the partners and the interns, whoever it was that had the best idea, that's the one that we used. There, was no, there were no egos, which was just amazing. And then how to use technology as a design tool. I came from the Rhode Island School of Design with a bow arts background. You know, laser cutters and 3D printers kind of scared me, I'll, I'll be honest, but, um, but we started to use it in building our furniture. This is um, one of the first lights that we built uh, using the laser cutter. And I'll, I'll talk more about it a little bit later in the lecture, but it's, you know, we, we made something that you couldn't have made before. And then how to run and build a practice. Now, I understood the business of interiors. I knew how to do interior design. But I basically got to build a small firm within shop um, from the ground up. So this was really my testing ground that gave me the confidence to go on my own. So then, in May of 2014, I started K&Co. Um, and because of all my experience, I really had to think, where, where do I want to sit in the spectrum of everything? I had experience doing more corporate work. I had experience doing more boutique work. And I really felt like there was a way to marry the two. And this is something that I bring into all my projects. I approach even the smallest project and the largest project with the same process, hoping to get the detail of a boutique project in something very large, and hoping to get the efficiency of something very large into the small stuff so that it doesn't get too overwrought. So now I've got kind of all these different spectrums and I really feel as though I'm situating my firm to sit in the middle of all of this. So what are my takeaways? So I have a design staff now, there's seven of us total. Um, and you know, I looked at them and I said, okay, I've been at these three great firms. I want them to be at a great place also. What do they need to learn? So I really want my team to learn this concept of emotion and more. The concept of infusing hospitality into all types of projects. Place making. Creating architecture that's really just inside out. And material play. So I'm going to go through kind of each of these and uh, use some of my work as examples. So emotion and more. How do you distill this into a process? So we, one of the first projects when I was at SHOP was um, the offices of SHOP BOP, which is an online women's clothing retailer. They've been around since about 1999. Amazon owns them now. And they've never actually had a physical space. They've always existed on the internet. So and even their office in New York was kind of, they were sort of in a closet. And they, they just they needed a space that really spoke to who they were. So we looked at their brand book, and their brand identity online was very clear of who they are. And you know, I sat down with them, and I have this mood card exercise that I do with every client, from the tiniest project to the biggest project. And I will just collect anywhere from 100 to 400 images, just of ideas that I have for the project. And it's really just anything that I like that's inspiring, that I feel like could pertain. And we'll sit around a table for an hour. We'll just spread these things all out with uh, Sharpie markers. We'll make notes. We'll note colors that we like, materials, forms. If, if the client really has a bad reaction to something, it's great. You just take it off the table, and it's not there. And you say, I hear you. It's, this is off the table, literally. And so we'll take those mood cards, and then we'll start to create a concept story from this. And this is what I was talking about before that I learned when I was at Avroco, is really how to create this design narrative. The design narrative is not style. It's not saying, oh, it's French country. It's creating something new that you can't really title. And you know, the, the formula that I use for this, this is kind of a standard layout, is you'll have a tagline, and you'll have a place reference, a character reference, a detail reference, some supporting imagery down here, and then a quick elevator pitch so that when somebody says to you, oh, what's this project about? You can say it in two to three sentences in a succinct way. So this was uh, the concept story for Shop Bop. And it was, they wanted to have this kind of down, downtown chic vibe. They wanted kind of the urban bohemian who's their client, but yet they wanted a ladylike touch to it, so this ladylike vintage. 
Um, so we really tried to create the home where we thought the shop bop woman would live. Um, once we kind of have that design concept, we will follow up with mood boards. Usually these are, are tied to different spaces in the project and what these mood boards are, they, they start to uh, speak to color, materiality, and style. So this is where we start to pull all of these things from and they tend to be somewhat, maybe somewhat consistent, maybe somewhat eclectic. Um, you never know, it all depends on the client and this process that we're going through. So you can kind of see it's mostly white, some natural tones, some grays, some peaches and, and oranges, some just warm colors in there. These are um, a, an actual material board that we used for the space. So you can kind of see the reference between the, the mood boards where we started to when we were finally pulling materials. There's kind of a, a nice relationship. You should be able to squint your eyes between your mood boards and your material board and see the same color palette. Um, so just a quick note about programming. So we were given this floor, two floor plates um, in Midtown Manhattan. It was kind of an old theater company, law office type space. It was not, it, it didn't have that downtown feel. It was kind of done. It had wood floors and gyp walls everywhere. Um, budget wasn't huge, so we didn't want to spend um, a ton of money. We tried to keep as much of the of what was there as possible, but we, we tried to still reprogram the space in a way that made sense. So a couple, couple moves that we made. We, um, reception desk is off to the side. This is very tight here, this is barely even 10 feet. So we just made a nice seating moment at the entry with a nice backdrop. And then the receptionist is off to the side so that she's not kind of on top of you when you walk in, but she can still see everything that's happening. Um, the conference room was going to be an in, decided to be an informal conference room where they would have different um, brands come in and their buyers can pick from what they were, what the, the lines were for the season. They would also have celebrities come in and they would dress them for photo shoots and events and also they would just have parties in the space. So what we wanted to do, like any good dining room to private dining room in a restaurant, we wanted these spaces to be able to be connected or separated so that they could be flexible and either used for a larger group or smaller groups. So there's that entry. We modeled the desk after kind of more of a workbench, so it had a little bit more of an industrial feel. Um, this, is the, um, this was kind of the living room that was uh, the informal conference room. And then across the hall, we had um, more of a library space. And so we, instead of hanging grid wall that you would see in any kind of chain clothing store, we, had, we used kind of the, the proverbial library ladder to create that grid wall system so that they could hang all the clothes. So they actually use this to put together the, the lookbook photo shoot. So they'll hang all the clothes with the accessories and put the shoes on the shelf so that they can get all the looks together and then they'll take them out and shoot them. Just some other details combining. This is kind of a beautiful um, white iridescent paint over a white paint um, done by hand stencil um, kind of with these more industrial details that we had. You know, and taking every opportunity, we didn't have, the, the, this wasn't a huge budget. So, you know, we had shelves where they needed to store books and little things. And so we, you know, we actually sized these boxes to fit exactly eight and a half by 11 and 11 by 17 paper. So you can kind of stack them in this interesting way. And they were modular. So you're just making like, oh, I need, I need six of those 11 by 17 boxes. So it was, it was very efficient, but yet created this graphic on the wall. And then they were a cube culture which, you know, how do you warm up cubes? So we had, you know, one wall that was kind of running through the space, so we decided that we would clad this. Um, there's actually a half inch gap between each of these reclaimed panels, so you get this pinstriping effect. Orange is their brand color, but they didn't want it absolutely everywhere, so we wanted to have the space feel a little bit branded, but have it be a little bit more subtle. Another kind of lacy and industrial detail juxtaposed. So hospitality, how other typologies can take a cue from hospitality. So this was a, a great project. So we did a prototype classroom with Teachers College uh, at, at Columbia. Um, and we actually did a whole master plan for the campus to redo all of the spaces. It was kind of very inefficiently used. There were six buildings that were linked together. They were all Victorian era um, buildings. They had been renovated about I don't know, six times since, since they were originally built. 
And in the particular classroom that we did the prototype, I think we ripped out three ceilings and they were two feet under the windows, just to give you a sense of what was in there. So this was kind of what the school looked like before. It was the old Horace Mann School, um, which is now in the Bronx, uh, but it was an old elementary school that was eventually taken over. Um, and the question was, how do you take these kind of Victorian era the building and infuse acoustics, lighting, HVAC, and technology, all the things that you would want in a modern classroom. So we, you know, we kind of put our heads together and we came up with a couple concepts. Oh, and before I get into what those concepts are, there was the other thing was the user groups. It was a teacher's college, so they taught pretty much almost every discipline that you could imagine. There was uh, music, there was languages, there was history. So, and each one of those disciplines had a different format. So it had to function for a lecture, a seminar, or discussion, or group work. So not only that, we had to figure out where was the focus of the room. We had, we were on a corner, so we had two walls that had windows on them, and then we had two solid walls. So we had to decide where, where was the front of the room? Would there be a front of the room? So we took, we took all the different types of furniture iterations. We did, this isn't even half of them, and we picked the ones that we liked the best. And we picked the ones that we liked the best, and we came up with kind of three different typologies. There was the banquette, which was kind of this weird outlier that nobody kind of understood where it came from, but I said, yes, it could work, just like a banquette in a restaurant. This absolutely can work for spillover seating. It could be more comfortable. It could provide flexibility. So I, I kind of pushed that one in there. Nobody thought it was actually going to make it. Um, then there was the long table, which is a little bit more traditional. And then the single seat, and this, this version came out of all the research that was happening from all the different furniture manufacturers. They were pushing this kind of single seat concept, which I, I actually found was very inefficient. But this is how each of these different typologies could function for the lecture, seminar, and group. And then when we were going through how to add all of the acoustics, lighting, technology, all of that into here, we came up with three other concepts where there was the wainscot. This would mimic kind of the historical um, aspects of, of the building. The wrapper, which would thicken the walls um, and include all of that around the perimeter, or the pavilion, which would in include all of the new technologies on one wall and the ceiling. So we ended up going with the wrapper and the banquette were the, were the two winners. Here's just a quick material palette trying to um, fuse the old and the new together. So, you know, we have kind of a beautiful warm wood juxtaposed with a white wood and we have more of this kind of sagey green Victorian color that was popping up all over the building, but then we tried to update it with some more jewel tone details. So these were really quick concept renderings that we did. This is not necessarily even presentation quality, but you know, we just put this together and then built the classroom very quickly. And then there it is. So some of the things that we did, this wall is actually uh, proud of the existing wall by about 18 inches. All of the uh, HVAC is housed in the wall. We built the wall like a piece of millwork. So it all, um, so we had shop drawings. We basically gave the contractor, our, the millwork contractor, our 3D model of the space and we created shop drawings off of that. So there weren't really tons of construction drawings for this. Um, and then because the wall was so thick, where we didn't have mechanical or technology, we, tr we tried to squirrel away all the other stuff that needed to go in there. So we actually have a server closet in there. Um, you'll see there's a teacher's podium. There, this deep portal when you enter, we actually um, fit a storage closet in there that fit all the extra chairs when you didn't need them in the space. All the panels closed so you can have a much quieter space if you don't want all that technology. The whole surface was made out of whiteboard material so you can just write all over. Um, and then the banquette was a huge, huge success. When we finally started doing um, studies and observing how the classroom was being used, the first thing that everybody noticed is that when students would come into the space, they would sit at the banquette first. The banquette would fill up before the seats in the middle of the room. So another view with the screens open. And we actually made the seats so that they fold closed so that you could sit here, you can have a little side table next to you for your laptop or coffee, and then it also incorporated, um, you can sort of see it, uh, all the power and data. We made a conscious effort 
we had a long discussion to not put data in our power and data in the floor to only do it around the perimeter because at the end of the day we decided it made the space more flexible there's that detail of the podium swinging out the other thing um, when I first started this project the school actually expected us to either rip up the existing wood floor which was 120 years old or um, to put carpet down and I walked in and that was the first thing I noticed was how beautiful the floor was it was actually an old maple floor um, it needed to be patched in some areas but we we kept it um, you know which you know talks to the sustainability of these buildings if you build something beautifully and it can last you know keep it there's no need to cover over it with carpet that you're going to throw out in 10 years some details of the cabinetry so we have the kind of slick whiteboard panels with this beautiful whitewashed wood integrated handles just super simple so placemaking be methodic about the narrative a narrative is not style but a concept so Lillian Bloom was the last project I worked on before I left Avroco and this is a restaurant in Hong Kong and the Avroco was well known for public which is on Elizabeth Street in New York City um, it, it was kind of one of the first places to kind of take an industrial vibe and put it into a hospitality setting, a very different than what had been done before where it was more about glamour and luxury. Um, so the client was familiar with this space and, and restaurants in Hong Kong were starting to pop up that were similar to this that were definitely referencing directly a lot of the design details. So the client decided that they wanted to just bring us to Hong Kong to do the project and we were thrilled to do so. They wanted to be inspired by New York itself, and New York at the turn of the century in particular. But the reality was this is what we were working with. So how do you take all of the, the, the raw space, all of the history, and bring it into a place and not make it feel forced? So we're on uh, the fifth and sixth floor of a high-rise building in the middle of uh, the LKF district in Hong Kong. And so we, we got to work. So we started to look at mood boards, started to think about the things that we could bring into the space, started to look at how that related to the materialities we would bring into the space. So again, if you kind of squint your eyes at these mood boards, you should start to see the same colors in the materials. And then because we were close to mainland China, we were fortunate that we basically got to do almost everything custom. And I will add that from design until opening of this restaurant was only six months. And I don't recommend trying that here in the States, but we had um, a lovely contractor that we were working with and a lot of labor on site. So we were able to get this done and we had a lot of resources at hand. So we designed everything. And I will say we really designed everything, every light fixture, every chair, um, you know, all the tables banquettes and it even went down to some of the tiles we were able to source from Thailand and we were pulling from inspiration from our own home this tile pattern was actually um, a glazed brick that we had uncovered in the hallway of our office building um, so you know we, we we were like that's kind of a weird pattern let's use it so we matched the bricks perfectly and we were able to to get them made in Thailand um, and then there wasn't a lot of space, so we were using what we had as design elements. Um, you know, there's, uh, this is like our wine station, and they didn't have room for glasses, so we just made a big feature out of the wine glasses. Um, this is a secret uh, cigar bar, which is pretty popular in the area, um, and actually each of these panels, these were kind of inspired by shipping containers, where we would have all these stacked crates, and, you know, we kind of glammed it up a little bit with a, kind of crossbar in brass. Um, but there's all humidors behind here. So this is actually air conditioned space behind each of these panels that's uh, keeping all the cigars fresh. And then this is the bar upstairs on the sixth floor. This is that first light fixture that I was showing you that goes um, down to the atrium space. You can kind of see a little sneak peek of it. Uh, this is a private dining room or private lounge. So actually these tables flip up and open and can be at dining height, the legs kind of unfold and the light can actually swivel so that it's centered in the room so you can dine here um, if you don't want to use it as a lounge so and let me just point out a couple 
details in this shot. Some of the things that we did to mask kind of the awful windows that we had, so we just we kept the existing concrete um, and just polished it up. But you'll see that those windows are still there, and we did things, just tricks, to kind of not necessarily deny the space, but yet just to mask it a little bit. Um, you know, we raised the banquette a little bit higher. We have some foliage in here. We added um, a window treatment, and we also lowered the soffit under the seating where it wasn't important to have height. So really, you're just getting about uh, three feet or so of that awful window mullion, so it almost even goes away. So architecture inside out, blurring architecture and interiors. So when I was at CHOP, I was fortunate enough to work on the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. And this was the first project where I really got to be embedded with the architecture team to a point where that we blurred the line between the, where the, the quote unquote architecture and the interiors um, met. It was much more seamless. And so you can see, and I'm gonna point this out in a second, just notice these ribs that are on the exterior of the building, um, the vertical ribs. So what was really inspiring about doing a building like this was that we were in the city and we very much wanted you to feel like you were in, in New York, you were in Brooklyn, you, were there, you couldn't be anywhere else. So we loved kind of the patterning and the streaking that you would get on a rainy night. And this was really a lot of kind of the color inspiration for the building. And even, you know, all of the black and white that we have in the space, you know, taken from old uh, photos like this. And it really wanted to feel like, um, like you were going for a night out, that this wasn't just a sporting event. Um, Greg Pascarelli, who's one of the partners at SHOP, is famous for always saying sports is like theater with an unscripted ending. And so we really wanted it to feel equivalent to you going to a Broadway play, but you were going to a sports arena. So it really had to have that kind of excitement of nightlife when you were going there. So quick material palette. So there's and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but when you're doing big projects like this, it is so hard not to go material crazy. You want the spaces to feel different, but at the same time, you know, when you're having so much square footage, you don't want to be managing 200 different types of materials. So we really tried very hard to restrain the material palette and really only change maybe the finish of something. So if something's black, it's white somewhere else. The other thing that's really special about the architecture of this space that we wanted to pick up on in, in the interiors is that this is a very unique condition where when you're on the con in the concourse or in any of the private suite areas, you actually can see out into the street. This almost never happens in, in many other arenas or stadiums like it. So you're, you go into these places and you're completely unaware of your context. And we wanted to just enhance that feeling and not deny it. So here's a view of the context, or sorry, of the main concourse. And these are those ribs from the exterior of the building. They actually track in off the building and become this light datum on the interior. And it creates this false ceiling. With so such a large concourse, you're not going to put a ceiling in all of this. So you can see there's all this junk in here. But what happens is, is because the light is focused down and you have this nice light plane happening, all that stuff gets silhouetted and basically goes away. So it feels a lot more polished. And you know, we're taking opportunities to, to pull in elements from the exterior of the building using the weathering steel for the signage, taking away a lot of the noise that you normally see in spaces like this. All the signs are in white as well. There's white pops in all of the main public spaces. And then where we needed to create more identity for, for the different brands, this is a Budweiser bar, we would do things like incorporate materials that you would normally find contextual to this area of Brooklyn. So reclaimed wood would be something that you would find in any bar in the area. We didn't feel like we needed to kind of go with something that was a little bit more loud or garish. And then when you go to the private spaces, so what I was just showing you was where the main public goes. And this is now the suite level, so this had to have a slightly different feel, a little bit more upgraded. It's actually the same materials that you were seeing on the concourse, but instead of being mostly black with white and gray pops, this is mostly white with, some, with a little bit more gray and less, less black. So it's the same stuff, just, ch just changing the uh, proportions a little bit on where the color is. And then we, we designed all of the furniture in the space as well. 
Um, a lot of it was custom, even though the client came to us in the first meeting and said, no custom furniture. Um, I knew that that was not the right way to go, that with an arena with such specific dimensions in a city like this, that we were going to find furniture that was too big and would be too expensive. So we actually went the extra mile and we produced two furniture packages, one that was totally off the shelf, just in case I was wrong, and the other one that had all the custom pieces that would fit perfectly and align with all the needs um, that the owner and operator had, had uh, set out as requirements. So some other details. This is actually... Um, in the 4040 Club, which is a brand that Jay-Z um, is associated with. He owns the, he basically owns the 4040 Club. So some details of the bar. Um, our vendor carts, uh, this was an homage to the, the beginnings of shop with the project that they did at PS1 called Dunescape. Um, Something like this had never been done before. We couldn't find a vendor cart manufacturer that had ever put wood can you believe that? Wood on a cart like this. This was, um, and we just said it's teak. Teak is pretty durable and it's going to be inside, so we think it's fine. These things, I was just there two nights ago and they still look like they're in perfect condition. Normally you'll get all sorts of weird plastic panels and things like that on these that are supposed to be indestructible, but we said, no, 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 let's stick with kind of more natural materials. And then these are the vault suites. This is kind of the super luxe, more premium spaces. I actually, my firm just re renovated this space. So I don't have the photography back yet. But um, th this was kind of an interesting lesson. When Shop originally designed this space, it was 13 suites. And they decided to take one suite out and put in a champagne bar. So champagne bar didn't have, they weren't expecting a lot of traffic. They were just thinking, you know, we might serve um, this one specific champagne that was a sponsor for the, for the bar. What ended up happening is it was like freshman year of college. All the suite doors would be open, nobody would be in their suites, and everybody would be crowded around the bar. So what, they, what the, um, bar, the Nets and the Barclays Center decided to do was they expanded the bar. So they went from this little 10-foot bar, we now have a 40-foot bar in there, and they demoed half of the suites, and we put in beautiful seating in here. Um, so, it, you know, the design of the space really kind of works hand in hand with the programming and the programming that they said was going to work totally didn't work. People use the space in a, t in a different way and we responded to that. We observed and we changed it. And then this is that light actually that um, I was talking about in the beginning. Um, so th there was a story behind this actually. We, um, somehow this light got left off of everything and it was in a really important space. It was one, in one of the premium spaces, but nobody bought it. It was in no one's scope. And so it was six weeks to opening and I could only spend um, $2,000 max per light and that was even mu too much. And it, that was with tax and shipping and all of that and I knew I was gonna have to pay a rush fees. It was not enough money. And I know it seems like a lot of money, but it wasn't enough money. And, um, but also it was in an important space and it needed to be big. This could not be a small light for this space. You can't, you couldn't put like a tiny little pendant light um, hanging down. So the only thing that I could find that I could get to the site that was in budget was a Nelson pendant, which, a Nelson bubble pendant, which just would have looked silly in here. And so it pained me. So I sat down with one of my designers and I sketched something out and I said, can you write a grasshopper script to get this pattern on this light and can we figure out how to laser cut this um, in the model shop and I, I've got a cord kit in my desk let's see if this works so we did this um, pretty much with in less than one day of work we uh, laser cut it he actually put these tabs in here because he thought it would be easier to assemble but we like we thought it looked so cool <laughs> that we ended up maintaining it in the original design so we actually have all of these gaps and what he didn't realize it was easier for him to build it when he was doing it on the laser cutter but it was easier and cheaper for somebody just to tack weld at those points instead of trying to weld all of those long seams so it actually saved us a ton of money in the end in fabricating these things so we we laser cut this thing you know in in an hour uh, put it together because he had figured out how to put it together quickly and we, we literally hung it from our ceiling grid in our conference room. And I sent this photo, this is a photo taken with my iPhone to the client. And I said, I think, you know, I think you should come and take a look at this. So he showed up in the office the next day and he said, oh, you found the light. 
And I was like, well, not exactly. <laughs> we designed a light, and I'll find someone to make it. So he had enough confidence in that at that point after seeing how beautiful this was um, that he let me run with it, and we were able to deliver it on site and under budget. And so there it is in, installed. So material play. Fabrication is a material, too. So, you know, it's one thing. It drives me crazy when there are all these products out there, and everybody's always trying to sell you products, and it's like, it's like, well, there are materials out there already. Like, why can't we just invent our own products? And I always think back to the inventor. And this is really what David Rockwell's firm was about. He would kind of invent new things. He would invent new ways of, of doing things. We actually once built a bar out of, um, out of Maker's Mark wax, <laughs> which was really funny, or walls out of like paint brushes and things like that. He would just, we would look at things and kind of create new, new, new materials. Then there was the Frankenstein. This is what we did at Avroco, where we would take things that didn't necessarily go together and we would put them together. We were always taking like chairs and with one chair and another chair and putting them together and creating a, a totally new, new thing. And then there's the robot. And this is kind of what Shop does, where they, they kind of use technology to create new materials um, for their projects. But I think it can be simpler than that. And I think there's properties that you can apply to each of those methods to creating new materials. And really that when you're using materials to really be careful that every element needs a contrast partner. So you're always looking at contrast. And I'm not necessarily just talking about colors, but where there's a matte, there should be a glossy. Where there's a hot, there should be a cold. You always want to, where there's a organic, there should be an inorganic. You want to. As I said before, you want to restrain the palette, but consider all surfaces. Make your own textures and patterns to define space. Create spaces that are unexpected but warm. And how does the design narrative influence the material palette? How do you, how do you use material to reinforce that, that palette? Um, so East Market was what allowed me to go on my own. I was very fortunate, and I had a client come back to me, who I had worked with at Avroco when I was at SHOP. Um, SHOP was not interested in taking the project on. I had uh, brought other work into the office while I was there. and This was not one they were interested in. And it was something I really wanted to do. And I liked the client. And he said, you know what, I want to work with you. I don't care where you are. And so light bulb went off in my head and said, I've never had that offer before. And I said, great, will you hire me on my own? And he said, yes. So um, the project is located in Philadelphia. It's in a neighborhood that we're starting to call East Market. It's between Midtown Village and kind of the convention center area. Um, it, it's sited in an interesting way. It's uh, facing a pretty busy street that has large scale buildings. Um, but then the neighborhood behind is actually much smaller and much more pedestrian. And I'm working with BLT Architects on this. They're the architect of record. They master plan the site. The site's actually four acres and has six buildings on it. I'm just working on the residential portion. And they did a beautiful job. If you look very closely, the facade on, on the larger facing street and the interior street is almost identical, but they just broke down the scale in a really nice way so that you can feel, uh, feel the scale change between kind of the smaller streets and the large street. We started to work with our concept story, The Birth of First. This was. Um, we started to really look at what Philadelphia was and what had gone on there historically and what was in the neighborhood. And we realized that there were so many, it, it wasn't just about invention. There were so many people that were interested in, in kind of this idea of having workshops and um, creating things. So it was really kind of more of a creator space that, that we were looking at. We wanted to be inspired by these things. And a lot of, these are two of Ben Franklin's inventions. This is a battery, and this is um, actually a musical instrument. I'm forgetting the name right now. But we actually used these as uh, inspiration for custom lighting that you'll see in some of the renderings. So some mood boards. And then just some details. These, and this is um, under construction right now. I'm working with, um, I'm actually I'm meeting with the client on Monday to procure some cabinets. But some details, and just trying to contrast concrete with marble. We have this big LED clock, the battery light that we have in here, this kind of beautiful um, screen wall that we're, we're putting back here. This is actually something that we used uh, Grasshopper again uh, to create this pattern. I actually built a mock-up of it. The client was not very convinced of it because the rendering 
uh, you couldn't understand the complexity of it from the rendering. Um, it's actually taking three different metals and putting them together. It's a powder coat, uh, bronze, and uh, blackened steel. And then a word about uh, programming. So because it's a residential building and there's lots of retail surrounding it, we basically got the worst retail space for our lobby because the client owns the building, he wants to give the best retail to the tenants that are going to pay money for it. So this is kind of where we, we ended up. And so the idea is that you kind of walk in, there's a, a vestibule moment, the desk again is off to the side, you're, you're walking straight towards that feature wall and around to the elevator is a path. We've also incorporated something um, towards the back here. There was, there's amenity spaces throughout the building, but there was this tiny little requirement for like a 300 square foot business center. And I said, what do you mean? What's, what's a 300 square foot business center? And they're like, oh, you know, it'll have like a couple printers in it and like a couple workstations and maybe a conference room. And light, light bulb again went off in my head and I said, oh, okay, yeah, we should put a co-working space in here because what you're going to do is you're going to get a bunch of people who are in their early 30s who are moving into this building, a lot of whom are going to have jobs where they can travel or they're going to work from home. And if I ha I'm living in a small apartment in downtown Philadelphia, like what better way to be able to come down into the lobby and pull up at a library table with my laptop and sit here with a cup of coffee, which you can get from our little coffee station right here and hang out in the lobby instead of sitting in my apartment all day if I'm not going into the office. And what we started to do with the way that the space was programmed, we really ended up with a series of rooms through the space. So you've got the vestibule, you've got the reception area, you kind of have this almost transept space with the coffee bar at the end that leads you into the co-working space, and then you have the elevator lobby mail room back here. Um, what just what was planned for the space before I came onto the project um, and the architect had there I love working with these guys but they had assumed that this is where the reception desk would be so this is about um, 45 feet so basically you're coming home at 2 a.m. on a Saturday night and your doorman is watching you stumble all the way through the, the hallway so this it's uncomfortable. You don't want to have to walk that entire distance and have somebody watch you. It's like, when, when do you start talking to them? Is it when you go through the doors, when, you, when you're here, when you're right up the desk? So we felt like moving the desk off to the side improved the situation and also improves the experience because by having that path of circulation, you're really just creating two rooms. It's one and two. So you can vary the experience by going in a little bit more. So the amenity spaces is kind of a new thing for Philadelphia. A lot of the buildings that are being built now have amenities to them, and it's, it's a concept that's been happening a lot in New York, but um, the buildings are now just starting to do that here. So this is kind of a quick view of our demo kitchen. Um, if you wanted to have a dinner party for you know, 20 people and you didn't want to fit them all in your tiny studio, you could um, rent out this space. There's a full kind of chef's kitchen in here. Um, this is a beautiful wood wall that I'm so excited about. It's, um, we're working with this concept of doing wood mosaics everywhere. So this is the idea of actually taking materials and creating your own patterns with them. So instead of just taking like a, a cool design wallpaper, it's like, no, 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 we're going to like make our own pattern and we're going to do it out of material. Um, the same with uh, the flooring. We didn't want to put a carpet down here. We're actually um, doing all white tile and kind of a chevron pattern down here. Um, and then just another word about programming for this space, you kind of come off of the elevators and into the main amenity space and there's you know several different lounges, there's a TV lounge, a little billiards area, this is where that demo kitchen is, and then this is the fitness area and I felt it was really important. Originally you just had one entrance into the amenities, but if I'm coming out of being on the treadmill for 45 minutes, I don't want to see my cute neighbor upstairs who's sitting here reading the paper or on his laptop. So we, actually, we made a conscious effort to separate the, those two populations as much as we could so that you have two different paths of travel. And then in the amenity spaces itself, we actually have kind of these five different rooms that we've created and they all have sliding doors so they can either be combined. So you could take this lounge space and the demo kitchen if you want to have a big party or you can have kind of everyone in this lounge space here or this, this uh, billiards area can go to the TV room if it wants or it can go to the lounge space so there's multiple ways that the space can be used it's very flexible and you know this ensures that if a resident wants to rent out a space for a party and somebody else wants to come down and read a book that can all happen at the same time 
Um, corridors have this kind of nice unexpected moment of having some natural material in the corridors. We're using a very traditional beveled um, panel door where we're going to paint a little highlight in there so it has like a nice color. Um, custom lighting that we're doing that's sort of somewhat um, inspired by a bicycle wheel. And then the interiors, um, the vanity itself was based on the concept of, of a workbench again. And, um, and then the kitchen really trying to express the natural materials of the space. So they were, um, this was kind of a really fun project for me to work on. I really feel like I got to flex my, my own design muscles. Okay, and the last project I'm going to show you is the, the, the first built k Co project, which is El Camado. So Seamus Mullen is, he's an iron chef. He has a restaurant in New York called uh, Tertulia. And he opened up a little counter um, in, a, in a market called Gotham West that's on the Upper West Side of Manhattan called El Camado. And he wanted to open a second outpost that was more of a standalone. So um, here's Tertulia. And so we had the space, this is just a Google Street View image. It was next to a very loud and noisy bar. And so we wanted to kind of create um, you know, a more consistent vibe. So we tried to mimic a little bit of what was going on, but yet kind of have our own identity. Um, this was done on a shoestring budget. So we just you know, did a few test renders just to kind of have the confidence to say, OK, yes, this is going to work spatially. Um, this is actually the plan. It only has 34 seats in it. Uh, and the concept was that it would be a butcher shop by day and that it would be a tapas bar by night. So we actually are seating people in front of the um, deli cases. And so here it is in its glory. <laughs> this opened in March. And sadly, I have to say, not for the, not for the design. It is um, now closed as of last week. So that's how, how cutthroat the restaurant industry is in New York. So some details. So this counter actually slides out to make um, the bar counter continuous. But I will say that coming full circle and getting to do kind of a nice little jewel box of a restaurant project like this uh, has really kind of heightened my senses about where I've been and where I'm going. And what I kind of realized the most is that I really just, I'm still in it for the great parties. <laughs> Thank you. We can take a couple questions if there's any questions from the crowd that you would like to ask Krista. I'm going to go back. So you're supposed to speak into the microphone <laughs> for the recording. How old did you say you were when you had your first internship? Um, that's a good question. My first, first internship would have been in the summer of 99, so I, ha I was just turning 20. Any other math. questions? Yes, yes, that's correct. <laughs> I was 20. Okay. And my first internship, by the way, I had just started architecture school. I had no discernible skills <laughs> that could be used in an architecture firm. Mm -hmm. And I actually, um, but I knew that I had to have that internship experience. So I actually worked at a gallery in town. And because I had that gallery experience was actually how I got the job at the Guggenheim. They were like, oh, great. You are doing architecture and fine arts. and you have worked in a gallery before, come, come on, so. All of, I don't know if this works, but all of the custom furniture was, like who designed that? I don't know if that's with your firm or with shop or how did that all happen? It's kind of, it's always sort of been an all in effort. Um, at Avroco, we had the luxury of having an in-house furniture designer. And right before I left shop, we hired an in-house furniture designer as well. But it's kind of a thing, it's done in a number of different ways. And typically, everyone who's working on the project will suggest pieces. Sometimes we'll look at old pieces that we find on like first dibs and things like that. We won't necessarily copy them. I don't believe in doing direct copies. But we might find something that's like 
um, you know, a beautiful Victorian chair and we might update it by making all of the detail out of bar stock steel instead of doing it as, you know, like a carved wood or something like that. So a lot of times, a lot of the pieces will be more in inspired or sometimes, sometimes they're just also just to meet needs. Like the, the chairs that we did for the suites at the Barclays Center, I couldn't find anything that fit the bill. The, the owner, the operations, the food service, they all had different ideas of what the furniture should be. And I finally, I just said, okay, guys, everyone give me their top three things that this furniture needs to do or cannot do, and I'll design something. So we basically, they laid out the criteria and we just designed something. And it was kind of almost like designing to a code. It was just, it was there when it was done. And we just nuanced it so it looked nice. I think there was one more. Was there one more question over here? When it comes to managing discrepancies between your client's goals and your own goals, um, what are some things that you do to manage those and make a final decision? Um, I, I try to be as collaborative with my clients from the very beginning. And, you know, and that mood card exercise is a lot because when you come to the table with your first initial sketches and they feel like they've already had input, that makes a huge difference. You are already are starting to get their buy-in. And then when you're going through the design process in general, and I, you know, you might have to do multiple iterations. And if a client has a really specific reason that they want something done and you know it's not going to work, sometimes you just have to do it and show them why it doesn't work. But then you can't just show them why it doesn't work and not have a solution. So you have to say, okay, what you want doesn't work but I can get you pretty close with this, and this, this is going to be great. So it's really just being very respectful. You have to remember at the end of the day that we, for, we're kind of in a service industry, like we are. We, are, we have clients, and we're there to kind of help them get the product that they need. Any more? Uh, I've read some rather surprising criticism of Rockwell by some, some very big names. And it might just be based on petty jealousy or something. <laughs> um, you know, I, but I have heard some people say, you know, things like, is this interior design? And students who don't know, Rockwell has done some incredibly fabulous and successful, very, very glitzy restaurants in mm -hmm. Las Vegas and all around the world. Um, do you think any of that is justified? Or is your experience with Rockwell are you a continuation of that and that's very much who you are? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I always, I love David and I think he's, he's a master and I think that the hard thing is that a lot of the projects that they're well known for do not demonstrate the actual portfolio of work. It's, it's a very, it's kind of a very small view of all the things that they actually do. And I think that stylistically what's put out there in the press might be certain things that David or whoever is is more interested in than some of the other work that they're doing but actually there's there's a lot there and I think also that some of those comments and I and I've I've heard similar things are maybe not taken in context of where David actually brought the whole industry of an interior design before him I mean before he did Nobu restaurant design was kind of not even really on the map and so I think that he needs to be looked in in a more context and that he, the way they design and what they do is is constantly evolving. And, you know, there now there's so many designers out there that show us what you can do with a restaurant that I feel as though if that's not your one particular taste, then maybe it might be a different designer. So I, I don't know. I think maybe a lot of it is just not looking at the context of where he's been and maybe it's just a question of of taste great let's give her one more round of applause please thank you